Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome, 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 Last Year University Church. Welcome for those of you watching online, and welcome to everyone here who is in the place to be on this particular Sabbath. As we get started this morning, I just want to invite everyone to give up and go give somebody a huge hug today, would you? Let's do that now. Go ahead and get up and greet someone. Good to be warmed up and greeting and love and being together. We have a special event this morning that's going to happen right behind me here. And so I want you all to uh, turn your attention up there. Pastor Bill Davis is here with his granddaughter, Haley Davis, and they're going to have a baptism. Can we give that a big round of applause? Absolutely. Absolutely, Haley. We're, we're proud and we're excited for the decision you've made. Her parents, John and Taryn, have been a part of our church community for a long time and have moved to the east but still consider this their home. And so now, let's give some attention to this beautiful moment. This is a really special event for the whole family. Uh, John and Taryn were married here. Haley was dedicated here. And uh, today, she's going to be baptized here amongst family and friends. And uh, the last few months, we've been studying the Bible, right, Haley? We've been doing it by phone, long distance. You in Ohio, me in Utah, and now we're in California for the baptism. We are a very mobile family, as you can tell. We are grateful to be able to be here today. And Haley, I'm so happy to be able to be with you today and to baptize you. Want to have prayer with you before we baptize you? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and care. Thank you for Haley and all the joy that she brings into our lives. Thank you, Father, that you've put the love that you have for her in her heart and that she has chosen to follow you with all of her heart. Oh, Father, what a blessing it is today to baptize her. And so, Haley May Ching Davis, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you. Joy in the house of the Lord today. So let's get on our feet, let's celebrate, let's sing together this morning, shall we?
Why? 
is our Father's world. And as it is, I invite you to close your eyes and let us pray together. God, in the chaos that is wrought around us, in our shortcomings, in the insurity of tomorrow, we are reminded in celebration that this is still your world. That you are still the mighty God who moves beyond us, behind the scenes, constantly working on the behalf of this world. While we are in the midst of all of this, we want to give you glory and honor and praise because you saw it fit to continue us forward here as a church community. There are families who've struggled this week and yet you have brought them through. There are individuals here, Lord, who didn't have the answers they believe they should have had and yet they are here now. And so as a community, we give you praise and honor and glory. We confess, God, that too often we run before you and run ahead of you and are constantly trying to be the answer to our own questions, constantly trying to give ourselves peace. God, forgive us for these moments. And renew our spirit in you as we pause. God, we remember the Whited family and the Wright family. And all the families here who have lost a loved one recently, who are struggling through health issues, who are holding on to um, people in their lives that are struggling with health. Will you bless them, visit them, grant them more peace, hold them tightly this evening and reminding them that even in this pause of their relationships between them and life, that you are the God beyond death and that you have plans for each of us to be reunited. Watch after our family today. And as we are in worship and in celebration, renew our spirits. Bless us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Let all of God's people say, amen. Please be seated. We've got a couple announcements to you as we move into our worship time. Um, first of all, uh, I do want to remind you that it is Disability Pride Month, month of July. We are celebrating that. It's been a celebration since 1990. And it's, it's, it's about us making sure that we recognize and hold up those with disabilities and also to uh, not demonize or, or put aside or alienate, but remember that those with disabilities are a part of our community and it's a part of our natural world and it's okay for us to be together. So make sure you celebrate that and share your love with those around you. Um, as this is the month for that. Secondly, uh, we wanted to highlight two life groups because we want to get connected more and more and more. Turn to someone and say, let's get connected. Let's get connected. Here's a couple for you. Um, the first one is Monday evenings at 5 p.m. There is, uh, we are doing a ping pong Monday here at 5.30, 5.30, all right? If you like table tennis, I invite you. I'm, I'm, I'm there almost every Monday. Because, you know, I, I, I slay everyone down there. I hate to say it, but I'm the best ping pong player in all the universe. And uh, that is a lie. That's an absolute lie. I lose to everybody. But uh, you come down and have a great time. It's a, just an excuse for us to hang out and play and laugh. Um, our, our good friend Bart runs it. He does a fantastic job at it. And um, I'm down there with my kids. Bring your kids along. It's a great time. We just hang out. We play. for When you get tired, you can leave, all right? Um, that's Ping Pong Mondays. And then we've got another one. Um, if you could put that up on the screen for everyone. Yes, free sewing club classes here 12 p.m. through 5 p.m. So, um, and I believe that's first, third, and fifth Thursdays of the month. If you are wanting to get into this, this is your chance. Come out, get involved, jump in there. This is something I've not been to, but, I, <laughs> but I'm going to bring my sewing machine out because I'm the best sewer in all the universe. I don't want to brag or anything, but yeah. So if you want to come and compete with me, 
<laughs> I might show up there one of these days. Anyways, it's a great opportunity to come out and really just to connect with others, all right? So put that on your uh, stuff of things to do. Get out and, and enjoy the community together because as we bond, we grow, amen? As we bond, we grow. Fantastic. Finally, this church can't be here without you. You have been so faithful in giving, and we want to just encourage you, continue to give. Uh, because in our tithes, we're helping pastors and teachers, not just here locally, but around the globe. It makes a huge difference for the kingdom of God. In your local church budget giving, it helps us do fantastic things, and, and we want to continue to do that here at last year University. We want to continue to win people to the kingdom through the local ministries here. So please, give. You can give at the doors on your way out. Feel free to, to drop it into to the buckets, our amazing deacons are always hanging out there, ready for that. Or you can give online at lasierachurch forward slash give. God bless you all. Happy Sabbath. This time, let's get into the word. As is tradition here at La Sierra, I invite you to please stand for the reading of the word. As we focus our hearts and minds, souls and bodies to the reading and hearing of God's word. Our scripture reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. The word of God. Please be seated. That is the most valuable signature in the world that you see on the screens. Do you recognize that signature? It's a famous person. Not really. It's the second best ping pong player and sewer at La Sierra University, it's me. <laughs> uh, that is my signature and it is awful. How many of you have terrible signatures? Come on, be honest. Okay, and how many of you have beautiful, pristine signatures? Please raise your hands. See, you need to have it be like this, John, I saw you there. It needs to be terrible so it cannot be forged. If you have a beautiful one, it means you're taking your time and somebody can forge your signature. I grew up in South Africa, born and raised in South Africa. And one of the things that I enjoyed as a kid, I happened to get into sports, ping pong and all these other things. And one of the things we did as kids, as we followed our rugby players, a better version of American football. Where's Pastor Ben? Pastor Ben and I send each other uh, rugby Instagram messages probably four or five times a day. If you would like them, just let me know. But we would go around uh, to local state games and we would try and get the signatures on our miniature rugby balls. I think you have miniature footballs in the US as well, right? So you take that and then you try and get a signature of one of the famous players. The same thing with cricket. We would go to cricket matches, a much better version of baseball. <laughs> And, um, and we would go around uh, 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 cricket, rugby, tennis, and soccer, football, uh, real football, was kind of the thing that I always went to. And so as a kid, because sports was my life, I try to find these heroes of mine, and, and you try and get as close to the field once they're coming off so you can get their signatures. The most famous signature I got was from a person named Hansi Kronier, which means nothing to you. But he was the South African cricket captain. And he was in Bloemfontein, the town where I grew up, where my parents worked for the South African Union Conference. We went to a game, and Hansi Kronier was there, and I had my miniature cricket bat with a pen, and he marked it, uh, he signed it for me. I took it home, and I was like, yes! I have Hansi Kronier's signature. The unfortunate part about this is a couple of years later, we discovered that he cheated with money. What do you call it? Like when you, you throw games, yeah. Uh, and he was, yeah. So, so my signature was no longer a really cool thing. <laughs> but we go around trying to get signatures of people who uh, are important. How much do you think in the US the most expensive signature or autograph was sold for, auctioned for? What would you say? 
Just throw out a number. A million. The most expensive autograph in the US was sold for $722,000 and $500. That's pretty impressive. Who do you think, well, there it is. Thank you, Adam, for putting it up. I was like, I was gonna say, who do you think it was? George Washington, Benjamin Franklin? No, it was this person named Button Gwinnett. Awesome name. He, he, and his signature, you can find on the United States Declaration of Independence as one of the signatures there. But you would think maybe uh, it would be Benjamin Franklin or George Washington whose signature is more expensive in an auction. But the reality is that Button Gwinnett's is because his signature is found on the Declaration of Independence, but because he wasn't really famous, we do not have a lot of signatures from him. George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, we have lots of signatures from them. And so theirs sell for less than $20,000. But for Brother Button Gwinnett, his autograph was sold for $722,500 because his autograph is rare. The rarer the autograph, the more valuable it is. There are only 51 known autographs from Button Gwinnett. And so today, if you go to the next slide, Adam, we're gonna look at the three times that God wrote. There are only three times in scripture that we find God writing. And that is rare. And because it's rare, it is valuable. And it teaches us something about God. And hopefully God's handwriting better than mine. So today, briefly, we're going to look at these three instances in where God wrote. The account of it is given to us in Scripture. The first is, what is the first time that God wrote? God wrote the Ten Commandments. Here uh, is Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. It says the following. The words... The Lord spoke with a loud voice to the whole assembly at the mountain. Out of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, he added no more. God wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. So the first time in scripture that we find God writing, God writes the Ten Commandments down on two stone tablets. We do not know exactly how that writing happened and what it looked like on the tablets. Some people think it was two stone tablets, like the picture that was up there, and that you had five on the left, five on the right, and scripted this way. Other people think that it was two separate tablets that had an identical copy, because when you made a contract during those days, and also these days, it's important to have a copy. So some people think it was one tablet, all the commandments back to front, and a copy of it. Some people think that it was divided into the first two on the one, and then all the rest on the other. We do not know exactly what it was, but we know that God wrote the commandments down and gave it to Moses. This was 50 days after the Israelites had experienced freedom from Egypt and slavery. Why did God write the Ten Commandments? Why did God write this down? Well, Deuteronomy in chapter five and six gives us the reason why God wrote this down. Deuteronomy five verse 30, 33 says, you must follow exactly the path that the Lord God had commanded you so that you may live and so that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land you are about to possess. Why did God write the commandments? So that you may live well and long. And God reiterates this as we go to chapter six, verse one through three. Now these are the commandments, the statutes and ordinances that the Lord God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you're about to cross and to occupy so that you and your children, your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep God's decrees and God's commandments that I'm commanding you so that your days may be long. 
Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in the land, flowing with milk and money, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, had promised. Why does God write the commandments? Why does God give it and write it and give it to the community? It is for wellness. God gives the commandments and writes the first time so that communally and individually we may be well. If you know anything about La Sierra, at the end of the worship service, when we conclude the service, I will say, be well. And hopefully you will say, you be well. It is our congregational charge and greeting and sending each other into the week hoping and praying that we will be well, that we ourselves will be well, and that we share wellness in our community. The first time God writes is about wellness. The Ten Commandments are a description of what it means to be a thriving human being, and there seems to be two simple choices in the book of Deuteronomy. Choose between life and death. Choose between life-preserving uh, behaviors or life-destroying behaviors. The first time God writes, it is about long life and good life. It's about being well. Now, when you look at the Ten Commandments, this wellness comes in two forms. And if you look at the structure, if you put the next one up, Adam, you can see the Ten Commandments have often been divided in various ways. In the Jewish way, there are five and five. They see um, the fifth commandment is part of our relationship with God because honoring your parents is what God had asked us to do. In Protestant Christianity, for the most part, we divide the Ten Commandments between three and then the latter ones, six, and then the middle one, the Sabbath, specifically as Adventists. The first three have to do with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any idols. Do not wrongfully use God's name. Those all have to do with our relationship with God. And then the last six have to do with our relationship with other people. Honor your parents. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And do not covet. And then at the heart of the commandments, as Adventists at least we believe, is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath command has two parts to it. It says, because I am the Lord of God who brought you out of Egypt, therefore, keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? So God invites us into a relationship with God on the Sabbath where we and God, individually and communally, are in relationship. But then it also says the Sabbath is in the Sabbath command. It is for you, your manservant, your maidservant, the oxen and the donkey and all the animals and even the strangers within your gate. So the Sabbath commandment holds love for God and love for other together and is the heart of the commandments. Isn't that beautiful? So when God says, I want you to be well, God says, I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to be in relationship with others and I want these two to come together and worship on Sabbath. That's what you and I are doing right now. We are practicing wellness as we worship God and honor one another. So the way that this could be framed, oftentimes we think of the Ten Commandments as negative things. Don't do all these things. So perhaps if you go to the next slide, Adam, we can see it in this way. When God says, I want you to be well, God says, honor God and honor others. The first commandment, God says, orient your life towards me. Honor me through that. The second commandment, God says, honor me through not idolizing other things. It's easy for us to look at the Israelites and say, oh, we don't make golden calves. But we have these devices on our phones. Well, on our phones. We have these devices called phones. We have heroes whose signatures we crave. We have our job that we think is more important than anything else. God says, if you want to live well, honor me by speaking well of me. So God says, you want to live well, 
honor me, and then God says, if you want to live well, honor others. And so the fifth commandment about honoring your parents is for an invitation for us to honor family. Family first. Do not murder, murder is to honor life. And Jesus says in the New Testament, by the way, if you talk badly of someone, you've committed murder. We think it's easy. I don't, I don't kill people. But I talk about Pastor Iku, who's not a good table tennis player. <laughs> honor relationships. Again, it's easy. I do not commit adultery, I could say. Jesus says if you've looked at someone else lustfully, and so God invites us to honor God, to honor others through honoring relationships, honoring property, honoring the truth, and honoring ourselves because when we covet someone else's thing, the 10th commandment, we're not truly honoring ourselves and who God has created us to be. The first time God writes, God writes the 10 commandments and God writes about long life, about good life, about being well. And a reminder, well, let me just say one more thing. Yesterday I pulled off a book. It's called The Dating Secrets of the Ten Commandments. I shared it with Pastor Ben. I don't know if you started reading it. One of the best books still is from 2000 by uh, Rabbi Shmuley Botier. And even though it's from 2000, it's still one of the best books on dating I've ever read. So if you are interested in this, go take it up. But he takes the Ten Commandments and shapes it into principles for our relationship with others. And so he says the first commandment is about primacy. The other person needs to be the most important thing in your life. It's about exclusivity, it's about confidence, it's about sacred moments together, Sabbath commandment. It's about gratitude and compliments. We kill people when we don't compliment them. We need a compliment about mystery of sexuality, about sincerity, trust, and contentment. Wellness spills out not just in the religious life, but in our everyday life. And here is one more reminder if you did not know this. The context of the Ten Commandments is freedom. For in the beginning of uh, the commandments, God says, I am the Lord you God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Therefore, do not have other gods than all the other ten. Is that making sense? The Ten Commandments is about celebrating freedom with boundaries to help us be well in the world with God and with others. How beautiful that is. God wants us to live a well life. I asked Pastor Ricky to take a video for me yesterday. I'm gonna show it for you in just a second. We have a friend who on Sierra Vista Chapel in the corner here, every night around 6.35, Calmly and Ben during VBAC came out, he would park in the corner here, set up his karaoke machine, and have at it. <laughs> Who of you love karaoke? Oh, yeah. oh no, you're not my people. <laughs> karaoke, karaoke, your ability, in order to be in love with karaoke, you have to have the ability to just live in freedom and let it go, you know? So here is, if you got the sound up, here's a video of our friend last night singing. That's probably enough. YouTube or Facebook are gonna take us down now because of copyrights, but this brother was singing uh, uh, With or Without You from, from U2 the other night, and I waved at him, and I gave him thumbs up, and I sang as loud as I can with him. I need to go walk over, we need to go meet him. Maybe he can come sing for us here. What does it mean to have a well life is to be free and to let your heart, your mind, and soul be taken over by God and honor for others. So the first time God writes the commandments, God writes about wellness. When is the second time that God writes? The second time that God writes we find in Daniel chapter five, when God writes on the wall and God writes judgment. In October 12, 
539 before the common era, we find the events of Daniel chapter 5. It has been 25 years since the events of chapter 4, where King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made himself proud. He reveled and marveled in his own pride, and he said, I have created all of this. And God says, no. And Nebuchadnezzar's punishment is that he becomes like a wild animal, and he gets excommunicated into the fields where he grazes and eats like a wild animal. That is what happened 25 years earlier in chapter 4, and chapter 5 now picks up from there. It's been 70 years since Daniel and his friends came to Babylon. And Daniel is now our senior statesman, and King Belshazzar has this huge feast with all of the people of the land and the important people. And at this feast, pride and arrogance got the better of him. And he remembered the expensive gold and silver goblets which Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, had taken from the people of Israel in exile and, and taken all of this. And so Belshazzar says, oh, I remember, let's, let's bring out all these golden and silver goblets and things. And Belshazzar worshipped and praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze of iron and wood and stone. And if you remember the story, we pick it up in chapter 5, verse 1. It goes like this. King Belshazzar made a great festival for a thousand of his lords. And he was drinking wine in the presence of a thousand people. Under the influence of wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring the vessels of gold and silver to his father Nebuchadnezzar that he had taken to the temple in Jerusalem so that the kings and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the vessel of gold and silver that had been taken out in the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wife and concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of what appeared to be a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the wall next to the lampstand so that people can see. And the king was watching the hand as it wrote. So we see... The second time that God writes, God writes judgment. And we see the next verses here is a recounting of what Nebuchadnezzar had done, his grandfather, and how God, God had granted Nebuchadnezzar power, glory, and majesty, but Belshazzar's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, became proud and arrogant and temporarily became like the beasts until he turned his heart and mind to God and repented from his arrogance and pride. And then God restored Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel comes to interpret this and tells King Belshazzar that you have not been like your father slash grandfather Nebuchadnezzar and you did not learn from him. Nebuchadnezzar's heart became proud and puffed up and judgment came upon him. And so we see in Daniel chapter 5, verse 24 and on, so from his presence the hand was sent and the writing was inscribed. This is Daniel telling Belshazzar what the dream means. And this is what the writing means. Mene, mene, tekel, and parson. This is an inter interpretation of the manner. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And on that night, the kingdom of Babylon was overpowered by the Medes and the Persians. So we see, the first time God writes, in Scripture we find that God writes the Ten Commandments, and it's all about the good life, the long life, about being well through honoring God and, and honoring each other and experiencing the Sabbath as the intersectionality of that. The second time that God writes, God writes about judgment. 
Because the reality of life is that there are consequences for our mistakes. There are consequences for where we choose to go wrong. There are consequences when we are arrogant and pride and puff ourselves up to say that we play ping pong better than others. <laughs> there are consequences. Whether we choose them or not, sometimes we're recipients of consequences that we did not choose, of sinful ways of people around us. The reality of life is that God has created us to live a whole good, well life, but you and I fail, and there are consequences, and that there is judgment. It's from this story we, where we get the phrase, the writing is on the wall. You know that one? The writing is on the wall. Oh, I didn't study for my exam. The writing is on the wall. I didn't prepare for my sermon. The writing is on the wall. I have to go superficial, we can't go too deep. You know what the things are that we sometimes miss. There are sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins that we do purposefully even though we don't know we should do else otherwise. There are sins we do we don't even know or are aware of. The writing is on the wall. There are consequences for our actions. But there's a third time that God writes in scripture and you already know what it is probably, right? When is the third time that God writes? The third time is when God in Jesus, God incarnated, writes in the sand in John chapter eight. We know the story really well, it is beloved. Is in fact a story that's not found in our earliest manuscripts, something that was added later, probably around four or 500 after Jesus. This was added by scribes and made part of our canon and the church embraced it as part of the canon. And I'm so glad that the church did. We'll read through it quickly here, John chapter eight. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, maybe we can say a woman who was taken into adultery, written by men. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been taken into adultery and making her stand before them all, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, teacher, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against Jesus. And this is where we find the third time God in Jesus writing. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to him, let anyone who, of you who is without sin be the, first, be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. See, the Pharisees come, the religious leaders come to trap Jesus. Because they've heard about this Jesus and seen this Jesus who is trying to live a well-rounded life, a life of wellness in relationship with God and relationship with others, whoever those others might be, whether they be crippled, whether they be diseased, whether they be demon-possessed, whether they be people with a shady background perhaps, even when there are people who are led into adultery. No mention of the man here, by the way. The story is very troubling in many, many ways. We don't have time to unpack all of that, but where is the man in this picture? We don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand we can come up with ideas of what we think it is. Some think that maybe Jesus wrote their names down. Some people think that maybe people wrote all their sins down. Some people actually think Jesus was just scribbling. <laughs> yeah. 
It doesn't matter really what Jesus wrote, but Jesus enacted compassion on this woman who's been wrongfully accused and in a relationship abused. So it's a, it's a trap because if Jesus says, no, we will not stone this person, Jesus is breaking the law of Moses and then seeming to be weak on the law. If Jesus says, yes, stone her according to the law, then he is opening himself up to defiance of Roman law, which, is prohibited, uh, which prohibited Jews of executing the law by themselves. So it's a catch-20 question for Jesus, but our Jesus rises above the questions of the Pharisees and says, neither do I condemn you. The first time God writes, God writes about wellness, about honoring God and each other and experiencing the Sabbath and this intersectionality of God and humans in relationship, where we honor God through not worshiping others and using and speaking God's name well where we do not uh, kill or steal or lie or all of that. God writes the first time about a good, long life. The reality of life is that you and I get caught up in the tension of the world, of doing what we know we should do, but sometimes we don't. And there is judgment and there are consequences, but praise be to God. God writes the third time and God writes in the sand, stoops to our level to forgive, to embrace, to liberate, to uplift, to transform, to have compassion. Jesus scribbles in the sand. How is Jesus different from other religious leaders of his time? I think it's because Jesus had the capacity to be compassionately present to all sorts of people in all sorts of situations. In fact, the verb here to write in John chapter eight is exactly the same verb that is used in the Greek Old Testament in Exodus 32 when God wrote the commandments. So, God writes three times and tells us about what it means to be followers of God. What it means to be individuals and communities seeking to live after God. The first time God wrote about being well and invited us into that. The first time God wrote, there is judgment for the consequences of our actions. And the third time God wrote, God wrote forgiveness and compassion to liberate us, to reframe our lives with God's compassion. There is, by the way, a fourth time that God writes in Scripture. But this is a metaphorical writing. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, God says to the prophet, this is the covenant I will make with the people of God after that time, declares the Lord. I will put their law, my law in their minds and write my law on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. There is a fourth time that God wants to write. God wants to write God's law of love in our hearts and put in our minds. See, the challenge with the people of God was that they embraced this whole life, the Ten Commandments that God had given, so that they could prosper and have a long life, but somehow between that time from Exodus to the time of Jesus, religious leaders had made this whole life to be a rigid Commandments set in stone that became external to the point where people thought that they had to perfectly keep the commandments and then only God would come. And they failed every single time. So this beautiful thing that God had created by the time Jesus comes had become externalized, a list of to-dos when what God had given us is to be, not to do. And God comes and says, I want to change your heart of stone for heart of flesh. I don't want 
your following of me and your living for me to be an external, but I want it to be an internal thing. I want to write my love on your heart and set it in your mind so that you can live from the inside out. Three times God writes. God writes for us to lean into a life of wellness by loving and honoring God and loving and honoring each other. The second time we know there are consequences. We can get stuck with our consequences so often. Isn't that right? I did this. I'm not good enough. How can I do that? I'm not worthy. But praise be to God. Jesus stoops to our level and raises us up with loud and loving compassion. It says, neither do I condemn you. I invite you into the fullness of life that is not external, but is internal. And that will reframe your life, your family, your community in this world. And in this way, we follow God. By loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our body, and our neighbor as ourself. I pray that God will bless you as you open your heart for God to write God's love in you. Amen.
Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you to our worship team for embodying worship. We have Calvin Hunsai here today, one of our youth. First time playing for worship for us today. We just love it when we're our youth. Thank you, Calvin. So uh, church, as is tradition here, as we uh, go into the week, we invite you to say the Lord's Prayer in whatever language or translation is close to your heart. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. So now, people of God, go in the name of the God who is our firm foundation. Go in the name of Jesus who is love embodied. And go in the name of the Spirit who writes love in our hearts, now and forevermore. Amen. Be well, church. Amen.